means fundamentally that you can use your transformer, which we normally mistake and you use as a step-down transformer, as a step-up transformer. And that is, you know, what Chesterton called absurd good news. That sudden recognition that makes you say, of course, that's what the of course is about. Um, I want to ask a question about the economy of energy. I mean, you talk um, about the energy required to move up a level of consciousness each time. It requires a certain level of intensity, creation of pressure. Um, and it, the step between level five and level six, I take it, is, is primarily a question of duration or the ability to maintain that pressure and yep. energy. Yep. And. Um, when we exist at that level of consciousness, as you say, synchronicities happen, we feel happy, we feel in control, we feel on top of things, um, we feel that things are going right. And yet, it seems also that we have at some point, a, 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 an intuition starts to creep in, look, uh, we're going to have to cut back somewhere, or we're going to run into the wall. That, that this is somehow too good to keep going along. And at some point, we must relax uh, to recharge our batteries or to um, somehow rejuvenate ourselves so that we can continue moving forward. And so where does this extra energy come from? I mean, how is that, is that suspicion merely a delusion? Um, is there some sort of vast energy resource somewhere that we don't know about that we draw on? Or is it a trick? Or what's, what's the deal? Um, there is indeed, yes, a vast energy source, but I don't think that's really concerned. I think that what you're asking me is based upon the same misunderstanding as this notion, if we had peak experiences often enough, wouldn't they turn into plateau experiences? In other words, um, what tends to happen on level five, spring morning consciousness, is that it does not tend to last for long, merely because you were so used to level four, and you just tend to let go and drop down to a low level. Now, what happens when you get into great states of interest and intensity, you begin to get such a feedback from the external world that with an extra effort of will, you push yourself up into level six. Now, on level six, the feedback, so to speak, of interest from the external world is so much more intense. You get that weird feeling that Aldous Huxley described when he take a mescaline, that, you know, things are blazing with their own existence you also feel as if the external world is actually literally talking to you. You get this strange feeling of communication with it. And as I say, you would no more um, let go then than a child would fall asleep at his own Christmas party. You're so wide awake, it's just the feedback of meaning coming in. You are no longer having to push out so much. You're getting even more back than you are pushing out. And so you stay quite naturally in this level. In other words, once we are above level three and a half, it becomes increasingly easy to go up. You're not looking for more energy. Um, as the intensity you're experiencing causes you to see this thing that surrounds you. And that in itself arouses such an optimism that you're getting this powerful feedback that pushes you up and up. But why then do you come down? Mm -hmm. um, well, at the moment, you see, as far as I'm concerned... Um, I have managed to keep myself fairly constantly up at the top end of level four. And I can, with an effort, pop up into level five at will. But even then, you know, just purely physically speaking, I find it a bit difficult to do. I mean, yesterday I had to stay in Berkeley overnight because I had to be on the radio at eight o'clock in the morning. And some friends had kept me up until one o'clock in the morning, sort of talking and drinking wine. I got up at seven staggered along to the radio station and realized halfway there that this was stupid. I'd better make a really great effort. I made this effort, calling as it were upon Stan, got my inner pressure up really high, did the broadcast, and then went on and did a pretty full day of sort of, you know, talking, interviewing, various other things right through until midnight last night. But at midnight, midnight last night, being driven home in the car of a friend, I just suddenly felt that I just could not keep awake one second longer. And, you know, just purely physical. I suppose I could have done if some emergency had arisen. But the time had come just to let go. And I let go and I sort of, it was like falling into a black hole. I just slept for about nine hours solid. Now, we're always doing this. And, you know, this on the whole is a healthy and sensible thing to do.
So there's no question of why do you come down to lower levels. It's obvious why we do. What's so important is when you wake up to push yourself back up there, taking that as the norm instead of accepting a lower level as the norm. This is the way you stay up there. You see, I'm now 57 years old, and I've been trying to do this ever since I was in my early 20s, and I'm only just discovering that I can do it, that I can stay up there for long periods at a time. Yes, I, I'd like to ask you a question about something you wrote in Ritual in the Dark. And, uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll just read a little quote, and I'd like you to, to elaborate on this point. I think it's an illustration of, of this falling down to the lower levels, and this character, Austin, I think, symbolizes this. Um, if the world's good, it's because somehow life's all one thing. That's the meaning of sanity. Everything's a unity, not just life, but even water and stones. And that's why Austin's insane. Do you realize he needs other people? but he doesn't really believe they exist. Life's meaningless to him. He's a man without a future. Mm. Well, don't forget, I was writing about um, a typical criminal, and of course I've also written an enormous amount about the criminal because he fascinates me. The basic idea of ritual in the dark was that there is my hero, Gerard Sorm, who has always felt that what he really wanted out of life was simply to be allowed not to work, to have a small room of his own, just enough money to spend his days in libraries and thinking and writing and listening to music and doing the things that he feels he really wants to do. Now, accidentally, he get, comes into a small legacy just big enough to enable him to do that. And to his horror, finds his board stiff. That when he wakes up in the morning, you know, just as I said, on a winter morning, this wonderful feeling of how nice the bed is, and when you stay in bed all day Saturday, he's exactly in the same position. Here he is with what he's always wanted, and suddenly he's bored. He cannot get himself into these states of intensity. Hermann Hesse wrote about it in Steppenwolf too. Now, he goes along at the beginning of the novel to the Diaghilev exhibition in London, meets this curious homosexual who fascinates him, gets to know him better and better, and begins to suspect that he's a mass sex killer. Um, he's fascinated, fascinated by this, and at the same time realizes with shame that this external stimulus is raising him, as it were, giving him the level of intensity and interest he needs, and that he should not need this. And I've always found that writing about crime produces precisely the same perception of values in me. To see the sheer stupidity of the crime is like an alarm clock going off in my ear, making me aware that I am underestimating my own life. And this is what's happening to the hero there at the end. It's that sudden perception of the real difference between himself and the criminal. You see, what I'm saying is this. Our ordinary human consciousness is criminal consciousness. What's wrong with a criminal is what's wrong with us all. Shaw said we judge the artist by his highest moments, the criminal by his lowest. We are in the high moments so occasionally, so um, at such long intervals, that we are virtually criminals 99% of the time. It's only when we see even worse criminals that we suddenly realize with a shock that, you know, what we are doing to ourselves and that really, after all, you know, we, we should be making more of an effort. And that's what all my work on crime is about. You might, you know, call it um, Zen in the Art of Crime. That's, um, that's what my books on crime are about, waking up. And this is what he's talking about there. Yeah, can I follow up on that? Um, I get that from your work. I really, I really enjoy reading you. And I just wondered what kind of relationship you've developed with uh, perhaps some enlightened law enforcement any place <laughs> in the world. Has anybody really taken your work to heart and had a dialogue with maybe ways to deal with criminals in a more enlightened way, rather than punishing them and throwing them away? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I've, uh, yes, had many experiences of um, talking, for example, to the police at Scotland Yard and talking about this curious problem of dominance, that the fact that most of the worst criminals are very high dominance individuals who've gone the wrong way and that the worst thing you can do is to stick them in a jail with a lot of other prisoners 
um, and you suddenly get an induction effect, and they're causing all kinds of bad problems. Now, I talked to this about Sir Robert Mark, who was Commissioner of Police at Scotland Yard, and he actually put this into effect and started taking the high dominance criminals and keeping them in isolation away from the others, which I think you know, is a good, sensible kind of thing to do. But even so, um, this is not what really interests me. I mean, the relation with you know, the police and so on. In a certain sense, the real way to apply this kind of thing is to recognize how easy it is to change a criminal into a normal person by changing his attitudes. You know, I've written in my book about this psychologist you have, Dan McDougald, here in the States, who became fascinated um, in the 1950s by the Georgia state authorities who wished to flood some very good land to make a dam. And the farmers hired McDougald, who was a lawyer, to try and persuade them to flood some very bad land instead and leave their good land alone. Now, that seemed to McDougald such an obvious thing to do that he thought he'd have no trouble at all. Instead, he discovered they were virtually deaf, as if they got their hands over their ears. They just weren't listening. And it took about two years of legal fight, you know, and $50,000 of the farmer's money before they succeeded in doing it. Now, he was baffled by this. He just could not understand it until he read of an experiment at Harvard in which they'd connected a cat's oral nerve up to an oscilloscope so that when you rang a bell in the cat's ear, the oscilloscope needle went over. The vibration went down the nerve and down into the oscilloscope. If, however, you put a, a cage with white mice in front of the cat, it became fascinated by the mice. You could ring the bell in its ear, and the oscilloscope didn't move. Now, this was absurd. The, the eardrum had got to vibrate, and therefore the oscilloscope should have moved, even if the cat was ignoring it. It was literally cutting out the noise at the eardrum. It was stopping its eardrum fi from vibrating. And suddenly McDougald saw that that's what the Georgia state authorities were doing, and not only that, he suddenly saw that's what criminals in jail do too. That they've got themselves into this negative state about the world in which the nice things just don't get in. You know, like Scrooge in Dickens' Christmas Carol going around sort of muttering, Christmas humbug. And then the spirit of Christmas past makes him open up and, you know, remember his own childhood. And as soon as he's open, in other words, up beyond level four, in come the memories and the feelings. And suddenly, once again, he's taking in the whole world. Now, McDougall found that he devised methods, which I now can't go into, for actually making criminals open up like Scrooge. And he was getting a terrific rate of cures with what he called hardcore psychopaths in the Georgia State Penitentiary. Not only getting these cures... But he found his psychopaths, once he'd cured them, were able to preach this to other prisoners and, and cure them too. And at this point, the Georgia State authorities stopped the experiment. You know, proving what McDougall had been recognizing from the beginning. That somehow you can't get in through the ears. And so somehow all of these things are closely connected together. There's a way of opening people up so that they see these things... And then there's just one more interesting point to make about this. McDougald found out that, you know, I was saying earlier that most of us are sort of 48% um, real human being, a 52% robot. Now, those figures were actually something that was discovered in experiments by a man called Jerome Bruner. He discovered that, in fact, we tend to deliberately filter out something like 98% of our experience. You know, all, our, all kinds of feelings that come into you. Um, they're of no use to you, you know. For example, as you're now in this room, the heat, <laughs> heat of the room, the fe feeling of a chair against your body, your clothes, you know, perspiration, all of these things are irrelevant, and you deliberately cut them out. Now, he discovered that criminals, in fact, cut out something like 98.5% of their experience. And it's that extra half percent that makes them criminals. And that mystics cut out 97.5% of their experience. So the difference between the criminal and the mystic is just 1% of what you let in. Um, but he was asking about before about the energy. Uh, it seems to me that when we're at the lower levels, we're a little bit like the, the guy that was trying to zip his pants up with one hand and zip them down with the other. 
and you can get an awful lot, use up a lot of energy that way without doing anything. Or uh, my uh, other example is it's like driving a car with one foot on the accelerator and the other on the brake. Uh, all you got to do is take the foot off the brake and a whole bunch of new energy shows up. <laughs> and there's, it's not a matter of trying to dredge it up anywhere. Yep. It's already there. Absolutely. And of course, that's what I was saying earlier. Our main problem is that we are, we are so completely negative and we don't realize how far. You know, the Hindus say the mind is the slayer of the real. And this is our problem. We, it's, our problem is not how to get into peak experiences, but how simply to dump the totally unnecessary negative experiences that prevent us from getting into the peak experience. As soon as you recognize them as negative and just throw them out, quite suddenly you're on the verge of the peak experience all the time. It is, as you say, driving with one foot on the brake half the time. It's just a habit. Yeah, yeah as absolutely, it's just a habit. But a habit that, as you can see in the case of these prisoners in the Georgia State Penitentiary, can be broken by a flash of insight. In other words, to, to a certain extent, by reason, by logic. Now, I think we just better have about one more question, and then we better pack up. Uh, yes, I'd like to hear your comments about the uh, new subliminal technology that may encourage peak experiences as well as possibly something to do with the criminal or treatment of criminal activity. And what kind of subliminal? Um... We hear about audio cassette, video. Oh. Yep, and in fact, I went down yesterday afternoon to something called the Paradise Shopping Center near Sausalito, where... Um, in fact, I lay there on a couch for three quarters of an hour with goggles on my eyes and earphones on my ears. Um, these strange sounds and colors that flooded in were supposed to balance both halves of the brain absolutely perfectly um, so that, you know, you would begin to spontaneously have peak experiences. Now, indeed, it's a fascinating experience because if you open your eyes, you can see all that's happening is that two little lights are flashing on and off. Close your eyes, and you get these great washes of color, of different colors going across you like the waves of the sea. And at the same time, sounds coming into your ears and music do actually produce the most peculiar effects, like hovering between sleep and waking. So you're wide awake, but in this curious um, between sleep and waking state. The only thing I did notice was that rather, as I was saying earlier, when I had this massage at Esalen and it had no real effect on me because I was already so relaxed, I found the same kind of thing with this. I enjoyed it. it was, I felt like a cat being stroked. But it certainly, at the end of three quarters of an hour, it had no profound effect on me at all. Obviously, I think to a large extent, I'm already balanced. I was already in such a, a cheerful, sort of normal mood that all of this had no real effect. However, I think techniques like this are of terrific importance because, you know, I'm sure that, um, for example, as I say, in epileptic attacks, you've got electrical waves piling up and bursting across the brain from one side to another. We could, in the same way, induce peak experiences, you know, by discovering what is the technology of the peak experience, what waves are actually involved. <laughs> However, as I say, I feel that in the long run, that is not of any importance. Once you've actually achieved it, it doesn't matter much. What matters far more is that part of you that stands above it and looks down on it, the real you, as you might say, that understands what's going on and that can really begin to do the manipulation of your own nervous system. Now, just one more, maybe. I want you to comment on the use of drugs as a help or a hindrance. I was interested when you said Spinsky and Ward had had the nitrous and they experienced such a turmoil coming down where you were feeling fine with getting back to the world and there seemed to be a naturally induced state of will as opposed to a drug and it seems like there's this uh, induction of people taking a lot of drugs to try and get to these states and not using something that would be much more readily at hand and cheaper, which would be the will. Yep. Well, as you know, I described in <coughs> the appendix to a book called Beyond the Outsider how in the early 1960s, Aldous Huxley had suggested to me that I should try taking mescaline. And he said, you know, that it's a, a very unusual kind of experience. 
Now, I managed to buy some mescaline sulfate with no problem at all and took this stuff. Um, it was a most extraordinary experience because I expected to go into mystical ecstasies and all the rest of it. What happened, first of all, was that I vomited for an hour. <laughs> and, but my system had, abs had absorbed so much of the drug that as I lay there on the bed, um, when the vomiting had stopped, I went into this exquisite state of universal peace and happiness where I felt as if the bed had turned into a kind of gently rocking sea. And I felt this enormous universal sense of meaning and connectedness and so on. Um, the only trouble was that I felt, as it were, that I was being entered by the universe and immensely guilty because, for example, my little daughter came into the room and I felt that I had no right to be in this state because my business was, you know, to look after my wife and family. And then in this stupid state, I was completely, totally helpless, as if tied down like Gulliver. Um, I kept saying, as I was in this state of exquisite happiness, I swear I'll never take the filthy stuff again. <laughs> And um, you see, my problem is quite simple. Um, this drug had taken my mind, which I can narrow down very well. When I need to think hard, I can concentrate, and my mind narrows like a searchlight beam. You know, those old electric torches you used to have where you can twist the end and it'll open up wide or narrow down. Well, I can do this with my mind. And sometimes when I get intensely excited, it narrows even further until it becomes a kind of laser beam. And then it really works, and then I get the new insights. Now, mescaline opened me up like that. And there I was getting the whole universe coming in, and yet incapable of getting my mind closed. Every effort left it out there until the drug finally wore off. And even then, for days afterwards, if I ate radishes, it would open me up again like this. <laughs> I keep getting these flashes. Now, I realized that it was the opposite of what I wanted. What I wanted was narrow, narrowness, greater intensity, and I was deliberately getting rid of this. I realized that my natural state of optimism means that I don't require to be told that I'm in a good universe, that everything is okay. I already knew this before it happened. And therefore, in a sense, the whole experience was completely pointless for me, completely futile. It left me afterwards feeling, you know, I'd, not only would I not take it again, but I would, in a way, hate anyone in my family, let's say, to take this particular kind of thing. Because it, although it gives, can give you wonderful experiences, it also makes you appallingly vulnerable to all kinds of things inside yourself. And what strikes me is that this ability we have to narrow down is the power of control over yourself, which I lost by going to these states. This is why, you know, I felt basically it was a negative kind of experience. Even worse. I mean, you say it's all level six or. Well, no, mescaline, you see, obviously, like LSD and so on, is quite different from nitrous oxide or whatever they used. Um, it does appear, William James also had the same kind of experience as um, Uspensky and Ward under nitrous oxide. Um, mescaline, obviously, opens up some reducing valve in the brain and lets in the universe. In other words, it introduces you very quickly to level five. <laughs> You know, spring morning consciousness, magic consciousness, at its best. But opening you up in this way also makes you, in a sense, helpless. This is why I disliked it. I prefer to, you know, narrow down and open up as I want to. Yep, and as I did with um, this Reikian breathing and the pen trick, that put me up into level of, of five, even up into level six. Okay, just one more. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, there's a gentleman at the back there, and you've had a good... Uh, well, the difference between mescaline and peyote. Now, mescaline sulfate is uh, perhaps uh, a uh, synthetic, whereas the peyote... I mean, mescaline sulfate was like speed. It, it's just, it's so hyper, I mean, there is a vision behind it, but it's not, it's not hallucinogenic, but it's agogic. Whereas with peyote, you're removed. And you become just a witness. Mm. And you don't mind being a witness because you take leave of the world for a while, you put your responsibilities behind and take a, a brief vacation, and really becomes an examination of meaning, mm. profound meaning. Well, yeah, but let me say once again what is my central point. What interests me so much, what interested me yesterday when I was forced to get out of bed at six in the morning and go and do this broadcast in Berkeley, 
was how easy it was to get out of that state of physical tiredness, put myself into a state of intensity, and then quite suddenly begin to feel that the world is basically good and that I am in control of my experience. And when you're traveling, nothing is more important because obviously, you know, homesickness and all the rest comes from a sheer flood of experience burying you until you no longer feel you can cope with it. Now, that experience of being in charge that you get on spring mornings that poets have always had seems to me supremely important. And I realize that what I've actually done is what I wanted to do when I wrote The Outsider. To a large extent, I am in charge of what you might call poetic experience in myself. I can get myself into these curious states of bubbling happiness in which I get this strange feeling, you know, of far horizons. And it's the far horizons, you know, as William James says, that are the really important thing. So no matter what drugs do to you, no matter what peyote does to you, no matter how much you get up above yourself and so on, none of this matters really very much in comparison to that curious experience of being in control of the poetic experience. Anyway, I think we better stop now, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. Okay. I suppose what I want to say will sound fairly theoretical and abstract compared to the two speakers we've been listening to. But nevertheless, in a sense, it's very directly personal. <clears throat> I'm writing a book at the moment, a sequel to um, The Occult, which is almost finished. And, uh, Fortunately, I didn't begin it until two years after this book, The Occult, was published. Uh, fortunately, because two years afterwards, I had a very peculiar and very nasty experience that gave me a completely new insight into what I was doing. Uh, what happened, briefly, was that I started to experience extreme stress. I began to have a series of panic attacks which usually came on in the middle of the night and produced a condition of terror. This was very peculiar for me because I'm a sort of healthy, cheerful sort of a person. And, uh, you know, my general outlook is optimistic. It happened, I think, because <clears throat> I was overworked at the moment trying to edit uh, some sort of encyclopedia of crime and they were pushing me harder and harder until at one point I was producing 10 articles a week for this damn thing of 3,000 words each and churning out one and a half a day. But I was doing it fairly well, <clears throat> not really being able to relax in between, but bearing it. Then one day a couple of journalists came to see me and they talked and talked and talked and talked from six in the evening till three in the morning. Now this produced in me a condition of acute boredom And you know that <clears throat> when you start to feel tremendously bored, your response is a kind of, oh, no. And you allow your vital forces to sink completely. Well, this, in fact, is what happened. And uh, I went off to bed and woke up at sort of about four in the morning and began to think about the work that I still had to do and suddenly began to think, Perhaps I should go downstairs to my workroom and start, start on it right away. I realized, you know, that if I did this, I'd be completely around the bend. So I lay still. Then I made a curious mistake. I tried to suppress this feeling of dissatisfaction and tension and stress by willpower, by sheer concentration. The immediate result was very odd. My face began to flush and my heart began to beat and then quite suddenly, 
There was a sort of fear, that you, the sort of thing you might get if you suddenly discovered you were standing on the top of a very high wall and about to step over. And uh, I was afraid that if my heart went any faster, it would stop. So I leapt out of bed and rushed along to the lavatory and went and sat there. <laughs> and I sat there for about half an hour. It was like trying to soothe a frightened horse. So sort of just telling myself that everything was basically OK and that there was nothing wrong. And then finally, after about half an hour of this, I went and got back into bed. And the moment I got into bed, it started all over again. So this time I went out to the sitting room, put on the lights, and sat there and realized that internally I was a total wreck. My energies had reached a complete rock bottom. I was in a condition of exhaustion. I couldn't understand this. I kept thinking, there's nothing wrong with you. Why are you like this? You were fine a few hours ago. You, you haven't had any piece of bad news or something of the sort. And I wondered if I was having a heart attack because my heart was pounding away at a tremendous pace. The worst of it was that if I began to think about various problems, particularly if I tried to think in ultimate terms about, you know, who I am and what I'm supposed to be doing, then I really began to feel myself on the edge of a sort of terror. I realized that if I began to think in this way, I'd be going down a kind of mental black hole and there'd be no way of pulling out of it. So finally, I managed to soothe myself sufficiently to get back into bed, and I found that if I lay wide awake staring at the window, not letting myself relax too much, then very slowly and gradually I did relax, but with my attention still wide awake, and I went to sleep. And I woke up in the morning feeling a complete wreck. And uh, <clears throat> realized that what was scaring me most was that I didn't understand what had happened. Uh, this could come back again. In fact, it tended to come back towards evening. As soon as I, because I was determined I was going to carry on with the work I was doing, that I wasn't going to give up the encyclopedia I was working on. Always towards evening, my strength would go completely, and I'd suddenly find myself in a completely exhausted, floppy state. And then, if I sat in a chair, hoping to be interested, hoping to be entertained, switched on television, listened to music, I'd find that, in fact, nothing could get through to me. It was as if there was a barrier between me and the outside world. And in this state of boredom, lack of inattention, I could quite suddenly swoop down into intense depression. On the other hand, if I could sort of stop the depression while I was in a kind of dive and think about something pleasant, I could change it and get back up again. <clears throat> the comparison that occurred to me was of a, a glider pilot sort of going up and down. And as soon as I realized that, in fact, it could be controlled by concentration and that I could keep going up and down an indefinite number of times during the course of an evening, then I, at least I began to feel that this wasn't some sort of ultimate mental breakdown. There was something that I could do about it. Actually, I switched on the radio and heard Dr. William Sargent talking about patients in a mental hospital. <laughs> and uh, he, sa he said that the one thing that you never did was to introduce somebody who was really paranoid into a ward of schizophrenics because He'd often do something silly, like cutting his throat and alarming everybody. And this made me laugh, and I realized as I laughed that I'd suddenly snapped out of it thoroughly for that evening. It was only, only the second evening. In fact, I reviewed a book of Sargent's a few days later and mentioned that he didn't seem to understand this kind of thing, as a consequence of which Sargent wrote to me and said, look, it's perfectly easy to pull you out of these things. I'll give you drugs instantly that um, will fix it. But somehow I felt I didn't want to do it through drugs. Now, what I learned after a day or two was something rather interesting. When I woke up in the middle of the night, if I began to think about it, it began to worry me. And if I then 
let myself get too worried, I tried to stop thinking about it. And that was the worst possible thing. You know, it made me think about it more. And I'd suddenly go spinning into the panic. My heart would begin to beat and pound and my face would flush and I'd have to leap out of bed. I found that if I woke myself up as thoroughly as I could, instead of sort of lying there semi-asleep, it would instantly have the effect of subduing the panic. Almost as if a schoolmistress had walked into a, a room full of quarrelling children and clapped her hands and instantly there's a silence. Now, I called this the schoolmistress effect. And it struck me that what I was doing was to call upon another part of my being, a higher part of my ordinary conscious being, and getting it to take over. Of course, we all notice, you know, that in the middle of the night we can get into these low states, and you do notice that you seem to have slipped down the rungs of a ladder, so to speak. We all experience these odd ups and downs of feeling and emotion, and we realize that we're not the same person when we're in a state of depression. In a way, a lower self seems to have been allowed to take over. Well, it was thinking about this schoolmistress effect that began to give me the clue. I'd always believed that as well as having a subconscious mind below the threshold of ordinary consciousness, we also have what we might call a superconscious mind, which is equally unknown to us and which exists above the threshold of higher consciousness. Of ordinary consciousness. You know, Aldous Huxley said, if the mind has a sort of basement that's full of bits of um, dead wood and uh, insects and this kind of thing, why should the mind not also have an attic, which is equally unknown to consciousness? What I began to see was that, as far as I could see, based on this experience of mine, Whatever is up there in the attic is not, so to speak, a single person. It's not just one more floor of your building. There appear to be any number of floors up there. In the same way that in an odd sense there seem to be any number of floors down below in the cellar. You don't notice as you grow up into adulthood from childhood the way that you leave behind old selves and acquire a new degree of control and yet, in a sense, each of the older selves you leave behind is genuinely a complete floor of yourself, a complete rung of the ladder. But the interesting thing about this ladder, as far as I can see, is that it's not constructed like an ordinary ladder with two parallel sides and the rungs going across. It's something much more like a triangle, where the lower rungs are very long, and the higher you go, the shorter the rungs are. So that the problem of moving up the ladder to the next stage is, in a way, a problem of sheer effort and compression and concentration. That's why I managed to do it when I woke myself up very fully, just to get up that one extra rung and above the panic. I'd been fascinated by an experience described by John Bennett um, in his autobiography, Witness, in which he told of something of the sort. And I was writing about this experience of Bennett's only two days after the panic attacks had started. And actually just copying the big chunk from his autobiography was enough to lift me completely out of the exhaustion, once again into a completely normal, happy condition, which lasted for about two days. What Bennett said was that when he was at Fontainebleau, studying with Gurdjieff and doing these extremely complicated Gurdjieff movements, which, as you know, involved doing one thing with one hand and one thing with the other and something different with each foot and something different with your head, and so on. He said that he got out of bed one morning after an attack of dysentery, completely exhausted and greatly tempted to stay in bed, but he felt that something forced him to get out of bed. He said that later that day, Gurdjieff was explaining a new and extremely difficult exercise to them, and that... All of the other students dropped out one by one, except himself, and he said that he felt Gurdjieff's eyes fixed upon him and felt that somehow he had to keep going. And he said, and then quite suddenly, from total exhaustion, the feeling that he would drop at any moment, there was an enormous feeling of strength and the feeling that he could, if necessary, go on forever. And he said, when the exercises were over, he walked out into the garden 
and started to dig at a pace he would not normally have been able to maintain for more than about 30 seconds, digging like a machine, and was able to maintain this for half an hour with no feeling of exhaustion. And that he then went walking out into the woods and met Gurdjieff, who said something to the effect of, there is an enormous reservoir of energy which all human beings could draw upon, but most of us aren't very good at it. However, there are some people who are able to draw upon this energy, and they can pass it on to others. In other words, Gurdjieff has seemed to imply that it was he himself who had somehow done this. Bennett said that he walked on into the woods, and then he remembered something that Uspensky had said, that it's easy enough um, for us to make ourselves feel various emotions. You can, for imagine, wince if you imagine trapping your hand in a door. But that if we want to understand how little control we have over our feelings, try to make yourself feel surprised. And Bennett said, so he said to himself, all right, be surprised. And he said he was instantly overwhelmed with amazement and astonishment. <laughs> he said that everything he looked at around him, the, the, the forest, the trees, everything seemed so incredible. And he said then, he thought to himself, horror. And instantly felt a grisly, awful horror that almost shriveled him up. Everything suddenly seemed gruesome and un unutterably terrible. Then he thought, love. And said he suddenly felt overwhelmed with love, with the thousands of sorts and varieties of love. He said, we don't even begin to understand the sheer complexity of the possibilities of love. And he said after about ten minutes of this, um, he was actually beginning to feel exhausted with experiencing so many emotions and said to himself, all right, stop. And instantly it all stopped and went away. Now, this kind of control, I know can happen, even writing about it, as I say, two days after my panic attacks, was enough to give me the kind of control and shoot me out of the lower level, once again, up to the higher level. It is in a funny sort of way, just like this second wind that an athlete gets, suddenly improving and doing something absolutely perfectly. Do you remember William James talks about these moments when a footballer plays a game so perfectly that it's as if the game is playing him and he can't do a thing wrong? Or a musician who's played technically perfectly for years suddenly is carried away by the flow of the music and suddenly the music is playing him. These are the states in which we appear to leave this ordinary conscious level on which we live and move up one or two rungs of the ladder. There are all kinds of other ways of doing it. Um, my friend Ronald Duncan, the poet, when he was in India, he had an appalling cold the day he was supposed to be leaving India. And Gandhi said to him, go and see this doctor in northern Delhi. So Ronnie went to see the doctor who tied him to a sort of upright iron bed frame. And the doctor then pulled a handle, and the bed frame went over backwards with a terrific crash. And Ronnie said he got up swearing and cursing and feeling as if every bone in his body had been broken, and then realized the cold had gone completely. <laughs> <clears throat> but you can see that it is the same kind of principle. You're somehow arousing vitality instantly and rocketing yourself up the the, to the next rung of the ladder. Now, this is a fascinating thing because it makes me realize, how, here am I talking to you with a lousy cold, which has been going on for two weeks, you know, this flu. But in a certain sense, I'm sort of quite exhausted. And yet in another sense, there's another me sitting on the next rung saying, hey, come on up here, you mug. And because if I could actually get up onto the next rung with him, the cold would vanish instantaneously. Of this, I'm totally convinced. But the thing that fascinates me is that when I begin to write and I get deeply interested in what I'm doing, I become once again aware of being able to rise up several rungs of the ladder. Now, there are techniques of doing this, and all of the techniques involve doing your best to keep your mind wide awake. Gurdjieff knew about nearly all of the techniques. Gurdjieff could even project energy direct from himself into another person. Do you remember the story of Fritz Peters, who said that directly after the last war, he went to see Gurdjieff in the Rue des Colonel Renard in Paris, and that he was totally exhausted and shell-shocked 
and that he sat in the kitchen and Gurdjieff said, wait a moment, I've got to go and do something. And Peter said he was in such a state that he couldn't stay alone. So he rushed off to Gurdjieff, who saw how ill he was, went back and made him sit down and just looked at him. And then Peter said, quite abruptly, he felt an enormous energy flooding into his body and suddenly felt absolutely splendid. And then he looked at Gurdjieff, and Gurdjieff was grey and exhausted. And at that moment, there was a ring on the doorbell and a lot of people arrived. Gurdjieff remembered he was giving a party or something of the sort and went off to meet them. And yet five minutes later, came back into the kitchen looking again absolutely splendid, glowing with energy, and said to Peters some words to the effect of, thank you for reminding me. In some way, he'd realized himself by doing it for Peters that it was just as easy to do it for himself. And what he'd done, whatever he did, was to get up two or three rungs of the ladder. Now, my theory, briefly, is this, that all so-called paranormal experience, um, such as uh, telepathy, the ability to foresee the future, and this kind of thing. I've been investigating them a great deal over the past year or two, and I've no doubt whatever that they do exist and that they are genuine. I believe that the reason they can exist in contradiction to nature is that this higher part of us, way up the ladder, is able to foresee the future. In some way, he is above time. And in people who have this natural capacity, there's an odd kind of short circuit between your everyday self down here on this rung of the ladder and that higher self. Now, it's not a terribly useful capacity, this capacity to foresee the future or telepathy or, or whatever, to see ghosts. I can even douse, greatly to my surprise, and I never cease to be startled as the dowsing rod twists in my hands when I'm looking for water or when I walk around some of the huge standing stones down in Cornwall. There's undoubtedly some strange force there under the ground around the stones that I don't understand and that my mind doesn't understand and which my muscles in some way do understand. A force which I'm convinced could be tapped somehow. But it's of no particular use, these so-called higher capacities, unless you do it the hard way and clamber up the rungs of the ladder to get there. The accidental way of doing it, the short circuit way, is on the whole useless and sometimes dangerous. It's interesting to prove that it can be done, but few human beings actually benefit from so-called paranormal powers. Um, I've only got a few minutes left because we have to stop, but I just want to mention two more things that do correlate with this. Uh, in the early 1960s, an American lawyer called Dan McDougald was asked to look into a case of the state of Georgia versus certain farmers. Uh, the state had ordered the farmers to flood very good grazing land. Excuse me. And uh, McDougald thought this was stupid and agreed with the farmers. Now, when he went into it, he began to feel that the state of Georgia was in some odd way refusing to see the point of view of the farmers because they did not want to see it. And they were literally not seeing it. Then he heard about an interesting experiment done at Harvard with a cat. Someone had connected the oral nerve of the cat, which connects its eardrum and its brain, to an oscilloscope. So that if you rang a, a bell in the cat's ear, the oscilloscope needle jumped over. Now, they discovered that if they put a mouse in a cage in front of the cat and then rang the bell in its ear, the oscilloscope didn't move. And this was absurd because the sound had to travel down the oral nerve and was translated into electricity and should have made the oscilloscope jump, whether the cat noticed the sound or not. Somehow the cat was cutting out the sound at the eardrum itself, refusing to let it even get past the eardrum. Now, McDougald was working at the time with a number of people in the state penitentiary with hardcore psychopaths. And it suddenly struck McDougald that here you had a very interesting parallel. That these people, very often, were quite intelligent people. This is something I've noticed myself when I've occasionally lectured in prisons. 
The people in there are often a damn sight more intelligent than my students at the university. And certainly, you know, in some way more alive, more, more vital, more interested. And what MacDougall thought was that in some odd way, these people there in prison had got themselves into a, an attitude in which they were turned away from normal society, a sort of cutting it out at the eardrum. In other words, if they walked down a street, a street that a child would think absolutely enchanting because of flashing Coca-Cola signs and hot dog stores and all the rest of it, they'd be saying to themselves, bloody rotten civilization, you know, swine and all the rest, and somehow just not letting the thing get into them in any way. So MacDougall tried putting into practice his theory that if these people really are, on the whole, probably slightly more intelligent than the people outside prison, would it not be possible just to explain this to them? Now, believe it or not, he got something like an 83% permanent cure rate with his hardcore psychopaths doing this. He's, as soon as he'd really got one or two of them interested, and they really got interested and saw that if they could open up the senses, all kinds of fascinating things came in and they ceased to feel criminal about things, they passed this on to others who felt very much the same, and it, it spread. And as I say, he got something like an 83% permanent cure, at least after two years of, you know, checking. Now, the interesting thing about this is that he noticed the level of the prisoners, the way that their intelligence level and everything else seemed to go up once they got really interested in this business. What, what he'd done, in effect, was almost to give them a fortune, so to speak. In other words, they were feeling themselves dispossessed, miserable, the outcasts of society, hating everything and kicking back against it. Suddenly he'd given them something to make them feel that they weren't in any way dispossessed. And in fact, in a certain sense, they were better off than other people. Because standing outside society, they weren't subject to its values and therefore to these blinkers. The sad uh, corollary to that story is that after four years of this, the Georgia State Penitentiary Board stopped the experiments. Anyway, just one more point. In my teens, I noticed rather an interesting thing. When I used to come back very tired from work, I left school when I was 16, and my first job was in a warehouse. I used to stagger in at six o'clock, completely exhausted, and hating this sort of treadmill and feeling, you know, that society was going to keep me on this treadmill for the rest of my life, whether I liked it or not. And I'd find that if I started to read extremely gloomy poetry like Eliot's Wasteland or the poems of Edgar Allan Poe or Baudelaire, um, I'd get into a delicious mood of self-pity. <laughs> and that this would last about a quarter of an hour, and then I'd find that the self-pity had imperceptibly cheered me up. And that I now find that I wanted to read other things, um, like Milton or, or Shakespeare or Shelley. But after a while, and this was the interesting part, I appear to have taken off to a certain level where suddenly I could enjoy anything. Instantaneously, I could switch from Shakespeare to W.H. Auden to Poe to Chaucer. Complete and total changes of mood in every possible way and yet enter into the poet completely and fully. Now, I called these states of mind gliding, because when I got into this mental state, I seem to have got above a sort of bumpy, turbulent atmosphere into a sort of much calmer atmosphere where all I had to do was to swing the nose of my mind into different currents. And once I was there, it was amazing to realize that the currents themselves would carry you that you could think about almost anything and be carried along by the sheer delightful momentum of your thought. And this feeling of no longer being subject to the force of mental gravity, but completely free, convinced me that we continually underestimate our own powers and that we are all capable of states of intensity at almost any given moment. This is something that's fascinated me for years and I've tried to understand it in a technical sort of sense by making maps of the inside of the mind, by noticing precisely how we move from one state into the other.
And I must say that although many people have said that my sort of digression into occultism over the past 10 years has been absolute sheer nuttiness, I've learned an enormous amount from so-called paranormal experience and from seeing the way that people who do possess curious powers do appear to have just one or two unusual faculties, like, for example, Matthew Manning or Uri Geller, both of whom I'm convinced are genuine. And yet, I've never yet met a psychic who appeared to me to have any of this kind of control over consciousness that I'm now speaking of. This is why I say that it doesn't seem to me to be tremendously important, psychic ability. I've met one or two students of magic, ritual magic, who have actually developed some sort of capacity for the use of the imagination in gliding that seems to me once again to be extremely valuable and who also, to some extent, appear to be able to do things with their magical powers. And I mean by this very obvious and simple things. The wife of T.C. Lethbridge, Mina Lethbridge, once told me that if I wanted to keep away unwelcome visitors, I should simply draw an inverted pentagram on my gatepost with my mind before I went to bed. And she said that she always did this, and that, unfortunately, once she got back and discovered that the men were taking up the drive and she couldn't get back into her own house, and that she'd stopped doing it ever since then. But for some reason, odd little stupid things like this do seem to work. But the reason they work is that they're somehow tied up with these sort of higher levels of ourselves, and it's absolutely pointless knowing about things like inverted pentagrams or whatever, unless you've learned it the proper way by actually clambering slowly and painfully up the rungs of the ladder. Now, what is the basic formula for climbing up the rungs of the ladder? There's only one extremely simple formula. You must know that the ladder exists. Because as soon as you actually know it, like a curious child, you begin poking around trying to get up to the next level. Um, I've got to shut up.